Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's proclaim his greatness. Greater is the one who's in us. Greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. Stronger is the one within us. Stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Your light, your love endures forever. Mighty is the one. Mighty is the one who's for us. Mighty is the one who's strong to save.
doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing. Your love, my fear, doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing. Your love, my fear, doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing. Your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. my past behind oh i won't be shaken i won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when i'm standing your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i'm standing your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i'm standing your love What is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best estate is but vapor. Surely, every man walks about like a shadow. Surely, they busy themselves in vain. In Revelation chapter 5, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. We are a moment, you are forever. Let's all sing holy, holy, 
of the devil thank you for the word of our testimony thank you for the blood of the lamb thank you for the covering thank you for the strong tower into which the righteous run and are safe thank you Lord for all these things thank you let's thank the Lord with all that's within us thank you Lord thank you Lord Jesus Christ for all you have done for all you promised and for never leaving us alone Thank you, Lord. We've been placed in you, safe in you.
Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Cause your face to shine on us. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, let's do it a few times. Praise the Lord. 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 Amen. Praise God. Over here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Huh? Yes. Thank you. Why? Why? Why do we praise him? Why? Okay, good answer. Amen. How about over here? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How about in the middle? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because we were lost, now we're saved. How by the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. We are, our sins are gone. How many sins? Okay, count them. One, two, three, million, two million, three. How many million? How, mu how much? A lot. How many sins? All past, present, future. Yeah, how many times did Jesus have to die? Once for all. Isn't that amazing? Is our name in the book of life? Do we have the Spirit of God? We do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Wow. Yes. Praise you, Lord. Father, we, need, we want you to visit us here. In Jesus' name. We have assembled in your name. Maybe somebody has a very serious problem of some kind. Please pluck it up by the roots and cast it into the sea. Lord, remove it like you did the stone at the tomb, like you read, rolled the Red Sea back. Remove it, take it away like a cancer. Take it away in the name of your son, Jesus. An emotional problem, a relationship, a broken heart, a great failure, a great collapse, a great catastrophe a great pain, a great problem, a stubborn habit. Please, Lord, minister to us today. For you are great, you are great, you are great. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Is that, Pastor, I've got to see when the lights go on, I'm going to just see. Is that, no. I'm sorry, no. I thought you were another guy. I needed the lights on. Thank you. Good to, see, good to have you here. I don't know you. You look like somebody. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, just a word. Uh, I think we have five or six church plants going on this morning. The new one is Owings Mills. So this is their second week. Yeah, having a church there. Uh, we have Federal Hill, Owings Mills, Hubba de Grace, and Silver Spring, and, and Harold Harbor. And, uh, and then Pastor Love has a group up in Montreal. And uh, so they're ministering up there this morning. So I'm so thankful for all that work, all that is happening. It's not work. It's faith, walk, faith, faith, faith. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to, I'd like in the next w months or weeks, talk to you about money. Not this morning. I mean, now I am. But that's not the message. But I want to speak to you about money. But not so that you give us more money. But to help you. Because money is a big problem. The second thing is our weight. How about that, our weight? How about anybody have a weight problem? Okay, move on. Let's move on. <laughs> no, we're not talking about that. That's one area I, I don't talk about that because that's, that's too crazy. <laughs> but it does relate to, like, money in a way because money is something that God gives me that I can manage, 
use, control. I can also bless. And it's a great thing. I need help in it. I, I'm not, I don't pretend to be a, a guru on that thing at all. But I think every one of us could learn some things about it. And because I believe God wants us to be, you know, somehow we find God's hand in that area of our life. That we find God's hand in our personal life, in our mental life, our health, our emotions, decisions, relationships, and then at work, and then also with regards to money. So that'll be fun. So that, I said all that just to introduce the person I'm going to take the offering is Pastor Jerry Roberge. Give him a hand. Good morning, everyone. So I got to get up here after he talks about money and weight. All right, um, the verse I have is uh, Romans 13, 8. It says, Oh, no man, nothing but to love one another. And um, I know for many of us, that's one of our favorite verses. And um, I just want to say, I've been thinking about this for a while, that uh, we take a risk to love people. We take a risk. And um, once we take that risk, and we start loving people. Like, uh, my wife and I have been doing that a lot with Bible college students, with uh, just evangelism. And, and she brought three people to church today. But um, you take a risk when you love somebody. But you know what? There's rewards, too. And uh, you don't see the rewards unless you take a risk. And um, so that's my verse. And just for the offering, like Pastor said, uh, we need to uh, be disciplined with our money. So also the Word of God talks about tithing, so we're tithing, so we're disciplined there as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give in the offering. We ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.
right to the joy that's coming. So would you dare, would you dare to believe that you still got a reason to say? Okay, please stand, all right, and you know, I'm going to give you something to say to somebody, all right, you know, you're not going to have to make it up this time, all right, so uh, say to someone near you, next to you, behind you, I believe God is going to speak to us in the message, <laughs> all, right. all right, say it again with more feeling. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. First Corinthians, turn in your Bibles to first Corinthians chapter 10. Stay standing, please. Uh, Steve Sinsibus is here with us, which is awesome. Uh, Pastor Lange is here also. You praise the Lord. Uh, I don't know who else we got here with the crowd, but it, it's great to be here in this morning. Praise God. Uh, God, God we God, could, could God speak to us this morning through the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 1 to verse 13. Wednesday night message, we told a, we told a brief story about a woman who was very attached to her husband, and then later in life he died, and she's alone, and she just had a very hard time, a very hard time, like adjusting. And um, and in the little piece I read, this story about how this woman's life kind of collapsed and went downhill because, like, she couldn't. The question that was raised in the article, was her husband an idol that she had in her life, that she loved him so much that uh, she couldn't live without him? You know, good question. Uh, idolatry happens in our lives with many things where we love them so much that we forget about God. And it happens to rich people. Rich people use their money and they have power with their money and they enjoy it so much. They go from one project to another one and they really have power and influence. But then when the money is gone, who are they? And what life do they have? It's a good question. And you're in church this morning because I... Uh, because I think God wants us to go over this and think about it in our hearts. Because when you were lost, you were living in Egypt metaphorically, not literally. 
you know, but by, by the Bible example of being in Egypt as a slave. And when he brought us out of slavery, out of sin, then we found freedom and danced on the other side of the Red Sea, Exodus 15. And we, we end up worshiping God and amazed that we're out of Egypt and how easy it was to get out of there when God did it. When God does it, it's amazing. When God saves you, you are saved. Wow, that's good. And then, hey, you can talk back to me. I enjoy that. Come on. Hey, it's amazing when we were enslaved to sin and then we feel and sense the freedom and the worship and we go into uh, the wilderness and then 40 years later into the promised land. We'll explain that in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, you came to church because you're tired of listening to what everybody's saying on the street. You want to hear what God is saying in heaven, amen? I'm tired of the whole thing. I, I just, re, exhausting. Just turn to your neighbor and just say, put your arms like this, it's exhausting. Just go, hey, it's exhausting. Come on, I need some food. <laughs> hey, hey, you know what? I was thinking, I could have a whole church service with you guys just talking to each other. I, I could, that would be fun, you know, just have a good time. But um, we're not doing that today. Okay, ready? All right. Uh, you may be seated. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 1. The geography of our the geography of our message is important. And so I, I, I will draw it, let's see, we'll use this one. And this is uh, Israel going, and here's Egypt, and here's Cairo. And um, here is the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River goes down to the Dead Sea, and it runs out, or it doesn't run out anywhere, but this is the Red Sea the Sinai Peninsula, this is the Red Sea. So we have two places here for the Red Sea. And uh, this is Jerusalem. And uh, so when Abraham left home, he came from this direction. He, he, went, he came over this way and came into this land and walk through the land in Genesis 13. Walked all around and God told him, You're gonna, I'm gonna give this to you. Now there's two things about men that all the ladies should know. You know what they are? Two things about men, land and son. A son, to have a son and to have land. These are two big things. And this man doesn't have either. He left home, he doesn't own anything, he doesn't have any land, and he has no son. But God told him, and God promised to him. So that's at the very heart of our Bible, that when a nobody, an absolute nobody, is called by God, and God gives him land and a son. And that through that son, he would affect the whole world. You could, this is 4,000 years ago. This is not, not going to happen. But everyone in this room is gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. Every one of us are reading a book that came from Abraham and his story and his lineage. It's amazing. So in our message today, we've got three ge geographical locations. One is Egypt, and this is, I'll put here, slaves, the Jews. When they went down to Egypt, 400 years, 
before they left, they were 70 people. When they, when they, God brought them out, he brought them down here to the Red Sea and, and he brought them across and there were a couple million people. This is point number one is Egypt as slaves. Point number two is in the wilderness as complainers. They were complainers. They were also idolatrous. They made a golden calf. What did they say to the golden, about the golden calf? What did they say about the golden calf? What did they say about it? What? You brought us out of Egypt. What? The golden calf brought you out of Egypt? How long did it take for them to go to into idolatry when they got out of Egypt? Not long. This happened at Sinai, and they were there for a year and a, uh, one year and a half. And we don't know where it is exactly, but it's down in the wilderness. And this is an example of a believer who gets saved, but his life inside, on the inside. He is regenerated by the grace of God, but he's not living in faith. He's not experiencing what he has. He's not possessing his possessions. It's like a wealthy person with a bank account but doesn't know about it, doesn't use it, but he's got it. But it's his, but he lives like he doesn't have it. He's in a wilderness. And he's interpreting his wilderness experience very personally. He's very discouraged. He has um, murmurings and uh, murmurings or complainings, and there are seven of them. Nine o'clock, I said that there are 10, but there are seven. So you guys at the 11 o'clock service, you get the upgraded sermon. Uh, they are, they complained about the way, Numbers 11, the food, Numbers 11, they complained about the giants, Numbers 13, about the leadership, Numbers 16, about the divine judgments on them, Numbers 16, 41. They complained about the desert in Numbers 20, and then they complained again, again about the manna, the, the manna in Numbers 21 and verse 5. Uh, God led them this way. Look at, the, look at the picture. Do you know how long it takes to go from Cairo up to Israel by bus today? It's an eight-hour bus ride. Do you know how long it took the Jews to get there? Forty years. It's a real slow bus. <laughs> it goes boo, 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 underwater. Hey, they went to the Red Sea on dry land. Why did they go that way? Because God wanted to bring them out. He didn't use a chariot. He used their feet, and they went in the strength of the lamb that they ate that night in Egypt. And when they left, Pharaoh's army came after them. They got to the Red Sea. The Lord said to Moses, stand still and see the salvation of God. He stood still, and the sea opened up, and they went over. A couple million people. They say that the width of that opening might have been as wide as 10 miles to get all those people over through the night in some hour's time. On the other side, they're dancing and they are rejoicing because they were slaves. By the way, yeah, you, you and I don't know this, but to be a slave is not fun. You don't have a right to your own family. You don't have a right to your possession. You don't have anything. You don't have any legal right, no governmental right. You have nothing. You don't own any land. You cannot vote. There isn't any voting anyway in the time of Pharaoh. But to be a slave is a bad thing. 
I was a slave to sin, and you were a slave to sin. But Christ came to take us and, and change all that so that now we're on a mission. We have a calling. Isn't that good? We're called. We, the destiny is at the third point. They crossed over this way, and they go up this side of the Dead Sea, which is the ridge of mountains. It's very mountainous here, mountainous. And they, then here is where they stop. And uh, Moses sends 12 spies over to check it out, to go into this land, which is heavily populated by seven different people groups. And they go through the land for 40 days looking. And they come out, and 10 of them say, not going to happen. We cannot go over into that land. They are big people. Their cities have big walls. There are fortresses there. There's no way as a nation, as a group of people, we can go into that land. There's no way we can do it. But two of the spies said we can, and they were Caleb and Joshua. They quieted the people. They go, no, 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 wait, hold it. We can go. We can go now. We can go. God is with us. We can go into that land. This is the third geographical location of our message. To go in to the promised land. Deuteronomy 7.22, I brought you out of Egypt to bring you in to the promised land. Up on our screen, it means I brought you out of here in order to get you into here. But you stalled in the middle. You stalled in the wilderness because of unbelief. Uh, because of the flesh. And it's typified by Moses in the wilderness because it says that there was a, the glory of God was on Moses. It says that it was on his face because he was talking to God face to face and the glory of God was on Moses. So when he was in the camp with the people, there was a veil over Moses so they didn't see the glory. And it's a picture of how God is with them, but they can't see it. And so the, the veil is over Moses' uh, face. And so they are wandering around, meaning that they were traveling from location to location in the desert of Sinai. And this is very dry. I think it's a quarter of an inch of rain in a year that falls in that desert. It's very, very dry. You know, when we were there, we were on a bus there and we were traveling through there. And I asked the tour guide, there was a little tree about that big around. I said, how old do you think that tree is? He said, it's about maybe 40 years old. I go, well, it's like this tall and that big around because there's so little water there. They don't grow, but they live. Okay. These people had reason to say, we got a, raw, we got a bad deal. We kind of came out of Egypt, and we're going to die here. And they did. That generation that came out of Egypt died here in the wilderness. Only two of them, only two of them, and then the children and the two guys that came out of Egypt. So actually, out of the 600,000 men that came out of Egypt, there were only two that made it into the promised land. Not good odds, but a message. Many believers stall. They stall in the middle. Many of us, there's a veil. Even when we, we read the Bible, there's a veil over the Bible. And when the Jewish people read the Bible, I think they have very good many insights, but without the Holy Spirit, they're gonna be wrong. 
Not wrong in every area, of course, but wrong essentially because they don't see the glory of it. They see maybe the history and some morality and other principles there, but did they see the Messiah? Did they see the Christ? They didn't. Isaiah 6 says, their eyes are blinded. Their ears are dull of hearing. And the Messiah is in their presence talking. And sometimes his wisdom was so powerful, they just remained silent. They had nothing to say. And he hit, he hit the target. And they, if they could be humble, they could hear. This veil illustration is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it says that this veil remains on their hearts. But Christ takes the veil away so that we can see the glory of God in our everyday life. I want to emphasize that. In our everyday life we get to see the glory of God. This is amazing. Okay, so we can read, understanding those points, we can look at the text in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What does it mean? When the Jews were coming down this way, down this way, coming down and being led, there was a cloud behind them. And the cloud was light for them, and the cloud was darkness for the Egyptians. What an amazing illustration. That the cloud, the Egyptians are saying, where are they? Where are they? It's like darkness for them. But the Jews were, had light. They go, this is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Isn't that amazing? Be careful in life as you follow Christ that you would not fear those that are behind you, that are after you, because it might be they are in darkness and cannot see. For our life is hid with Christ in God. That we have died and now we live, but we live in a mystery. Colossians 3 and verse 3. We don't have to worry. He is our stay, the psalmist said in Psalm 18, 14. He is our solution. He is our guide. He is our comforter, our father. He is God. Okay, so verse 1. They passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, meaning God used a man. God used a man of God. I'm reading the prophet Jeremiah and getting a lot out of it. I, I love that, that book and how Jeremiah is the man. He's the, read chapter 23, 24, 25, and 26 if you want to and get to follow that line there as Jeremiah is in the midst of a world like the United States of America. Actually, I compare Israel with America today and the immoral living and the dishonesty and the sexuality problems that we are seeing in our public forums and seeing in our everyday life and seeing on the TV and the internet that this is like Israel at the time of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is saying, you leaders are not finding the answer to our problems, but, but God is speaking to me, and God is speaking to Jeremiah. That's another message, but a very good one. Look at verse 2. And they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. I think there was spiritual food in the wilderness. There was. There's spiritual food. Hmm. 
today with you and me. There's spiritual food here. I mean, everyday life for you and I, here and now, in our life. Be careful not to interpret your life only by your circumstances, because life is more than that. It's spiritual, and there's spiritual food for us. Uh, one doctor said to me, I've said it recently, he said to me, two or three patients a day come to me asking for anti-anxiety medication. And he said, they don't need a medication. They need a pastor. They need a pastor. Wow. Where are the pastors? Where is the message? Where is the comfort? Where is uh, the freedom in, uh, when we come out of the, through the Red Sea and we're out of Egypt and we are free? Where is the instruction? Where is the counsel? Where is the guidance? Where is the grace? Where is the message? Okay, verse 4. And they all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. There's a mix of metaphors there, isn't there? The cloud followed them. The rock followed them. They have spiritual drink. They have spiritual food. That rock was Christ. It sounds to me like God is taking care of them, even though they're in a wilderness. It was like when I went to Bible college up in Maine, I didn't know really where I was. It was like a faith decision. I went up to Maine. I was, I was up there that summer, and, and I went to Bible college up there, and I didn't know exactly. I didn't know who anybody. I was by myself. I met the church. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know exactly what was going on. There were many unfamiliar things with me, but there was some spiritual food, and there was a spiritual rock that was Christ, and there was something in my heart saying, this is the way. Let's walk in it. And I would like the same thing to be happening to you in your life. I don't know you. I don't know what you're facing, but I'm telling you, that the same God that brought them out of the Egypt is the same God that is your God. And he'll take care of you. And you might say, I'm in a wilderness. I, I never banked on that. I didn't sign up for that. Have you ever heard people say that? I didn't sign up. Well, I didn't know anybody had any right to sign up for anything. You're born into the world and you got this life to live. And instead of complaining about it, you follow him and he will lead you because he didn't lead you out to destroy you. He led you out to bring you in. He's got a place for you and he wants you to get there and he's going to take care of you all the way. However, look at the next part. It goes, verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. But I thought he brought them out, and they are his people, and he loves them. Yes. But sometimes God's chosen people are God's frozen people. Sometimes God's holy people are unholy people. Sometimes God's people he calls by name, they, they don't know God's name. They don't know who he is. They don't pay any attention. They don't have any focus. They don't have anything in the game. They don't want to lose anything. They want their life to be their way. They're not putting any skin in the game, they say. Uh, there's nothing in there, and I'm not making any investment. The best thing we can do is hear what he says and put it and say, I'm all in. I'm in. I'm all in. I'm going for it. I'll pay the price. I don't know what it is. But I want to trust him because I don't want this veil over me and over my life, all, all my life, where I can't see the glory of God. 
the ways of God, the Spirit of God. I want the veil taken away so that I can see. And um, what? Well, if you talk to Joseph in the Bible, he'd say, I went down to Egypt. I couldn't see. I was so hurt. My brothers sold me down the river. I ended up in prison. I was so hurt by the whole thing. But I decided that instead of me uh, being a problem, maybe God would use me to be a solution. What do you mean, Joseph? You were in prison. Yeah, in prison, I could have become a problem, but I decided that God, God is God, and he could use me, and I could be a solution. So one day, two prisoners had dreams. I interpreted the dreams from God, and I told them, when, I told the one that's going to survive, when you get out, tell the Tell them I did this, and he forgot. But then he eventually told him, and so on. So let's read it. It says, verse 5, part B, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. It doesn't say God overthrew them. It kind of get the feeling that they overthrew themselves. Have you ever gotten so negative that you end up collapsing by your own gravity? Your own negativity brings you down. You know, we get buried by our own, by our own sin nature. I don't need my... You, I don't need much to go negative and get heavy and get discouraged. It doesn't take much for that to happen to any of us. But verse 6. Now these things were our examples. All that we've said this morning is like for our examples. Huh? from Egypt to the wilderness up to the promised land. It's all speaking to us about our lives. We came out and we're, we're, stall, we're stalled in the middle and, and I don't want to stall in the middle. I want to move on and I want to learn and I want to see and I want to believe. Uh, I, I made my husband an idol, and when he was gone, my life collapsed. So maybe that was good for me so that I could find God. Maybe I, I lost um, my wife in, in a sad divorce, and my life is upside down. But maybe, maybe in the wilderness is where I will also discover God's faithfulness. If he could show me Lord, and the Lord say, hey, have you noticed your shoes? They're not worn out. And your clothes are the same that came out of Egypt. And they haven't worn out. Have you known, have you gotten to see that I'm with you? Actually, I'm taking care of you. I had one of those aha moments the other day when I realized, wow, look at how much God has blessed our lives how much God takes care of us, how much God is with us, how much prayer he answers, how much is happening that is good stuff amongst us and around the world, how we have a day school and a little learning center, and we have people across the street in dorms and private and single moms, and we have a, a good thing going on. And it's in different parts of the world even that it's happening. And we go back and we go, whoa, this is really, my shoes are not worn out. And my clothes are not wearing out. And I, I share that with my wife. I go, you don't need to be clothes shopping. <laughs> they're very good. They're 10 years old and they're do holding up very nicely. Very nicely. 
Okay, look at verse uh, uh, 6. These things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. Keep yourselves away from the evil things that we lust for, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And I'll add, when they made the golden calf, they danced and played and said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. I think we can get it upside down. You know, you say, oh, no, pastor, I'm a Christian. I don't have it upside down. Oh, no. That's the problem. These are Jews that came through the Red Sea, and they saw it. And believe me, there wasn't any golden calf that did that. There was no golden calf when they came out of Egypt. It was in their heart, but there wasn't any golden calf they're carrying into the Red Sea. No, that didn't happen. But how can I get it wrong? When I start to look at life with a veil over my face and over my heart, and I start to interpret life through my narrative, and that's why I need to always come back in a holy relationship with this word to correct me, to go to my heart and be a worshiper of Jesus Christ. You know the good indicator of uh, our doctrine is how high regard we have for Jesus Christ. I, you know what a good indicator is of worship? How much we love him, rely upon him, relate to him, how much Jesus Christ is responsible for everything that is living and moving and going on in our holiness and in our hearts of holiness. It's Christ that does it. It's Christ that started it, Christ that finishes it. There's nothing here in any of this, in any of this storyline, nothing about getting out of Egypt that is nothing other than Jesus Christ in the wilderness. It was Christ that got them through and going up into the land without any weapons, with any wrong ropes and grappling hooks to climb walls, without any big, no swords or military equipment or artillery, you know, what are those catapults? No military force to go into that land and conquer it. But it was God. Yeah. So go to the next one, verse uh, eight. Neither let us commit fornication. Ooh, there's a big word. What is fornication? It's sexual sin, relations with the opposite sex. And now it's with the same as well. We have to say that nowadays, I guess. It's sexual sin. Do you think any of that's happening? In our world here? Do you think that's the nature of man? I mean, does he get educated to the point where he gets out of that? Or does he even want to get out of it? No. It's here continually bubbling up, servicing out of our hearts and out of our minds and our behavior. Could you put, or could I put the, uh, the Boy Scout oath here? Here it is. Here's Boy Scouts law. Boy Scouts, this isn't a church, this is Boy Scouts. This is what I learned when I was a Boy Scout years ago. You, you had to think three fingers up like this and you, made, you, you said this like an oath to being trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent. I say this because the last few months I've, I thought about it and I go, I don't hear those words anymore. 
I don't hear them from young people on the street. I don't think they're being taught at all in public schools or university campuses. That's like ridiculous, these words. And yet, everybody, we need it. We need it. You want to buy a used car from somebody who isn't trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind? Do you want to rent an apartment with somebody who's dishonest, who's going to rip you off and break the contract and hurt you? Do you want to meet a policeman in the street who isn't these words? Do you want your mother or your father to be this way? Or do you want them another way? You can get angry about it. I'm not angry about it in one sense. I want you to understand something. This world gravitates to fornication, not to loyalty. This world gravitates to dishonesty, not to I admit my word is my bond. Even if it hurts me, I will be honest with you. Why? Because this is about God. I can't do these things without God. And of course, of course, I can't do them unless I hear the gospel and God say to me, you, you cannot keep the Ten Commandments. This is like a reflection of the Ten Commandments, really, in a way, one modified message of it. I'm not preaching the Ten Commandments. I'm trying to say something, that, that life has a moral part to it, and it's very important. And when I don't have God, and I'm uh, here in the wilderness uh, here, complaining, is it that one? I'm sorry. This one. When I'm, when I'm in the wilderness here, complaining and angry, what did they do? They fornicated. What did they do? When you complain, when you complain about your world, you got this flesh that's interpreting for you your world, then you don't have any power. And sexual sin is part of life. And you don't have any power. You just say life is bad. You know, you talk on a natural level. Let's read it. But with, with me, please. Verse uh, says, They sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell on one day three and 20,000. That means in one day, 23,000 people died because of a plague that came upon them. By the way, I don't think I need to say this. I love all people. I love, we love people. We love people that are, that are fallen into the sin of adultery and homosexuality and every other sin. We have a message and a ministry for people for them to change. We love all people. We love people. We care about them. We invite them in. We are not knowing people after the flesh. We are ministering Christ to people. And God does beautiful things. He saves them and forgives them and gives them a new life. But it is strange that in the homosexual lifestyle, they on the average live 20 years shorter time. Also 37,000 new cases of HIV a year with people that are living that lifestyle. So what am I supposed to do? Like sing its virtues or something? What am I supposed to do? Acknowledge it and accept it as these churches that are apostate, that put out the rainbow flag and whatever else that they do, and give the right hand of fellowship? That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. That contradicts everything that is good for people. Everything that will result in their benefit, in their growth, in their transformation comes through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is told us clearly, Leviticus 18.22 and other places in the scripture. This isn't to condemn. 
It's just to say, you come here, you come, we come into a spiritual doctor's office where we say, doctor, I need help. Put me under the CAT scan. And God puts me in the CAT scan and says, there's an issue here. I want you to humble yourself. I brought you out of Egypt, and I want you to get out of your stalled state, and I want you to get into the promised land. I want you to make progress in a spiritual way. I want you to be changed from glory to glory. That's what he's saying. Okay, look at chapter 10, verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ. Wow. That's a pretty strong statement. I read one of those, those temptations. What is it? Oh, yeah, I read it yesterday. It goes like this. Jesus is on the cross. This is arrogance. Pharisees are at the cross looking at him. They said, he said he's of God. Let God come down and take him off the cross, okay? This is Matthew 20, uh, 27 or 26. He said he's of God. Let God come down. It's like, whoa, do you hear yourself talking? Whoa, what are you saying? Wow. You don't even know how proud, how arrogant you are. How could you talk about God like that? He said he is of God. If he is of God, let God come down. Mm. You know, the pride that is in me and in you, it's a very real thing. I need, I need somebody to check, check it. I need the Lord to check it. My pride. I need, I want to be, I want God in my life. I want God to help me. But these people are in the wilderness and there's no limit to what can come out of their hearts and out of their mouths. They, they are able, they are able to be like just not recognizing the arrogance that's there. So they tempt Christ. Look at verse uh, 9. They were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, verse 10. Some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, for they are written for our admonition. It seems to me that this story could be part of my meditation all my life. Like this is for me, for all my life. It seems to me that, that we have a tendency to get into the wilderness and just stay there and complain about what God did to me. That God did this to me, I, I you know, I, I don't have any joy. I don't have any life in my spiritual, I don't have any freedom, I don't have any power, I don't have any persuasion in my spirit. I'm just kind of in the doldrums, kind of stuck in my way and in my life. And it's written here for our learning. And so verse um, 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So there's a good word for us. Let us that think we stand, let's be cautious and say, wait, I want to go. I don't want to just make it. I want to go into the promised land. I want to see the hand of God. I want to take on the enemy. I, wanna go. I want demons to flee from me in many directions. I want to see uh, people get saved. I want to see people uh, helped. I want to see people changed. I want to see answers. I want to see my kids make it. I want to see my wife blessed. I want to see my country. I want to see my church on fire. I want to see 
answers. I want to see God. I mean, I may stay in the wilderness, but I want to see God in the wilderness the way Moses did. I want to see that the manna came. I can say, the manna came. Mom, the manna came this morning. The manna came. We're okay. We got it. God is with us. Mom, my shoes are the same. Mom, hey, we got it. We're in good shape. Mom, praise the Lord. God brought us out of Egypt. Do you remember that? Mom, do you remember Psalm 104, 105, 106, 107? They came out of Egypt and they were never to forget it. That they didn't do it, that God did it. So that's it. One last one is verse 13. There's taken no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. You say, I can't make it. Yeah, I'll be, are you sure? Be careful with that. Yes, you can. I can't make it. I don't know. I, I ha, you, no, nobody can presume here that it could be very, very, very tough for some people. I have, we have a family in the church, and their son is having a very, very hard time on many levels and they're a great family. And it's like there are many people. There are folks in, that have lost children. And there are folks here that have had major, huge things. Family members have passed away and so on. And there's no presumption here. I'm, I'm not able. You, But if I think I am able, then I, I, I need to stand not like this. Or I think I stand, I will fall. But it's better to stand like this. Like, Lord, help me. You know, I can stand if you are with me. It's better to be insecure and find my security in God. And that's how I will get into the promised land. That's how I make progress. Not settling back saying, I got it, I got it covered. But you, you, you have you seen... What are you seeing, right? What are you seeing when you say, I got it covered? With that woman in the beginning of the sermon, she had her husband. And when she had her husband, she was fine. When she lost him, what did she have? So we got it. You know, we have it. We have it. And we just got to make the effort to main, walk in it, and God will maintain it and help us in it, and we'll grow in it, and we'll mature, and we'll be able to handle what God is going to put in front of us in our life. Please, don't be a person that says, when life is good, I'm good, I'm in the church, everything is fine. But be a person like this. I'm fine, maybe, praise God, I'm good, I can see God's grace, I know who God is. And when my world falls apart, when my world is not the way I would like it to be, when my world, like a young man, he was 25 years old, he lost his wife, he got married two years, his wife left, he collapsed. He collapsed, he, it was devastating. When my life is devastated or my world is upside down, don't panic. God did not bring you out of Egypt and save you so that your life would be destroyed. He brought you out and he brought you into the wilderness to teach you how to live with God. And as you walk with God, you will know him and you'll know him something like this. And then when you lose something, you go, okay, it hurts me a lot, but I got God. I'm walking with God. I'm okay, and he's going to bring me in to the promised land. And I'm going to end up glorifying God. I'm staying away from the sex stuff. I'm staying away from stealing and being dishonest. I'm staying away from my old man and all that he is. And I'm learning how to walk in the spirit and walk with God. And that's an amazing thing to get done in life. If you end up finishing life that way, then you are a winner. 
If you end up living like that and finding who Christ is in this short time of 70 years, and you find out who Christ is in your life, then you are a, a winner. You gained a lot eternally. That's amazing. Okay, that's it. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Might be somebody listening or here in the auditorium uh, or on the internet that is not a believer. This is an invitation to you. Uh, I would also ask the pastors to come on down front and just stand down here in front of the right in front of the platform. Just come on down. Thank you so much. And if you're here today and you're not a believer, but you would you say to Jesus personally to Him, "Oh Jesus, I have sinned. I am a sinner." I am not every, I, I, I have a need. I was in the Boy Scouts, I did that, but it wasn't enough. I was, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. I need Jesus Christ to save me. I wasn't in the Boy Scouts, I'm the worst person in this room. I'm a criminal, I, I please know my name. I'm a bad guy. You're the, exactly the person that God is looking for. God came for you. God is looking for you. God came to save you and everyone in this world. Come to Jesus Christ by faith in him. Please. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit of God. You must call upon Christ and he saves you. Anyone at all asking Jesus into your heart today, would you just raise your hand? The ushers will give you a booklet. Anyone at all in the auditorium? Anybody? Anybody at all? Thank you, sir. One in the back there. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Amazing. Amazing. And then at the end of the sermon, anyone at all that wants a prayer from any of these men down front, please feel free. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, God, for speaking to our hearts from your word. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Uh, any visitors here this morning? Anybody for visiting that, that we didn't get to acknowledge you? We just want to give you a, a hand. Thank you for coming. Anybody? Thank you. There's a man. There's two people. Thank you. There's Steve. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Thank you so much for coming. There's a free coffee, fellowship for you folks. Whatever you need, just come and talk and be with us. You are welcome. If you have a person, personal need, a prayer request, you want a prayer for healing, or you, you have some need of some kind, these men down front can minister to you, lay their hands on you, and pray for you. Father, we, we do want this week to be a week where your presence teaches us, and we want to walk in what we heard today. Thank you for it. The service tonight, to bring us back tonight to fellowship more in the mysteries of Christ. Bless our families, our things, our lives, our health, our friends, our family, and answer our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.